for you, I think it's interesting to recognize that because it's really, I think, an opportunity um, to, for us to, to try to figure out what's wrong, what's missing, what's the gap between the theory and the practice for, for different areas when we think it, it could work and, and it, doesn't, it doesn't actually work. And that's one of the things I'm doing in my research program now is trying to think about that and, and, and come up with new ways we talked about the Minecraft stuff last time, to, to make these technologies more practical and, and realize some of the benefits that are promised. Um, so this is another one uh, about uh, order retail or order management. Um, and I, and, and I, so, so this was nice because the theory of MDPs actually came from the field of operations research, which is a lot about making decisions like this. So, so this is... Um, the, so the idea is, is you're a shoe retailer, you're trying to decide how much you should order at the end of every quarter. If you have too much, then you've sort of spent money, you know, buying them and you're holding them in inventory. You're not making profit. If you have too little, then they, you might not be able to make all the profit that you could. And you're trying at every, and you don't know how much people are going to buy. You have to use it to decide how many to buy. Um, and then, uh, and then and then basically make a decision about what order to take. So, so what I wanted to highlight about this one is, is this idea of the transition model. So, and this was true for a lot of the, this is sort of true in general. I think this is one reason why MDPs are, are not used as much as maybe they could be, is that if you know this transition model, it's pretty easy to imagine solving something like this. Um, you know, you can discretize the, the size of the orders and stuff like that. And, and come up with a good policy for how much to order. But coming up with what this transition model could be, you know, some Gaussian distribution, not, not to criticize whoever this was, um, but, but, but actually realizing that as, so, as actual numbers that you're estimating is hard, right? It's not something that we really, like we, we have some ways of doing it, but it's not something you can just sit and write down uh, for a class project and expect to be right. It's, it's something that you have to estimate from data, and maybe your model isn't going to match your data, and, and there's a lot of subtle issues when you actually want to deploy these things in, in practice. So, so one of the things people are working on is something called inverse reinforcement learning, where you don't actually get to observe the reward function. You get to observe people following a policy. So you may be a person, like there's a guy who runs this business, and he's done it every single year. And he's really good at predicting how many shoes to order because he, he just knows. He's, he's, got, he's got the sixth sense, right? He can, he can do it. So the machine gets to watch. The, the problem of inverse reinforcement learning is he gets to watch the, the person doing that and then try to estimate the transition model and the reward function from that. Um, so, so what reward function is he actually optimizing? Or what transition function is, is, he, is he using? To, to make those predictions. And people do this in robotics as well. So, so you can have a robot where uh, a system is watching somebody driving a robotic vehicle, for example, or you can move an arm along a particular trajectory, and then it tries to watch what the person is doing, watch what movements the person made with, uh, when they were moving the arm, or watch what route the, the, the person chose as they were driving the vehicle. And then, if, uh, it, and then it can learn things like, well, I should drive on roads, because people like, seem to do that a lot. Or, if you, uh, another or, or conversely, if the, the, robot is dr the person is driving through the forest, it can learn, well, maybe I should not drive on roads. Maybe it's supposed to be exploring the forest, or it wants to be um, hidden, or something like that. So, so it can sort of learn these different policies from, from watching people. Um, so there's sort of a lot of interest in, in, in figuring out where we can get the, the, these parameters from, and, and whether RL as, as classically framed is, is the right thing. Um, this one I also really liked. So, so this was about packet routing. So, so this is like uh, the internet, right? You're trying to decide, uh, your, I think you're a router, and you're trying to decide which, pa uh, which um, path that you should send your packets in order to most efficiently have your Netflix movie download or um, have your, uh, what's a good multiplayer game these days? World of Warcraft? TF2. TF, what's TF2? It's, a sh it's an amazing it's game. It's like a shooting game. A shooting game. You wear, it's okay. A, it's like Halo, but you have hats. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> 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 All right, so TF2. You're playing TF2, and you want the throughput to be, uh, the latency to be as low as possible. You don't really care about throughput. and and that you know dictates one set of, of 
desiderata for the way that you should route versus you really care about throughput. You're trying to download a big file. You're, you know, you're doing BitTorrent. You want to get the latest movie, the Muppets movie or something. And, <laughs> um, and, and you don't really care if, if um, you know, it's just such a big file. It doesn't really matter the latency, but you want the throughput to be as high as possible. Like eventually you want to get as much packets through as, as fast as you can. And that decision sort of affects the, the, the routing decisions. And this is, um, um, so the person who did this formalized this as an MDP. Um, you know, the computers could go down and you have to sort of decide in the face of uncertainty what the actions are, which port you can send the packets on or which route you choose to send the packet. So this was really interesting because there's a pretty recent paper that just came out um, this is sort of the picture from it. It's called TCP X Machina, Computer Generated Congestion Control. Um, so who knows what congestion control is for TCP? Yeah? Do you want to you want to say? Sort of, yeah, it's <coughs> I'm not perfectly clear on it, but it, it's yeah. the general mechanism to try to keep um, a single sender receiver from completely crowding a particular right. network. Right. So yes, exactly. So like, if you are downloading your BitTorrent and you're, you know, so everybody knows how BitTorrent works. You're like, you're streaming files from like six different users, and you're sending files to six other different users, and you're using up all the bandwidth. And then what's going to happen to the poor guy playing? What's the game again? TF2. TF2. What's going to happen to the poor guy playing TF2 <coughs> when when somebody else is using BitTorrent and you don't do any congestion control? It's going to be a huge latency because the BitTorrent is going to just use all the available bandwidth. So what do we do in TCP? Does anybody know to, to stop that? It's a pretty simple little trick, yeah? That's why I know there are two mechanisms. One is yeah. the outer side quality of service, but uh -huh. also the outer Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the router can decide, I'm not going to, I'm not going to allow, I'm, not, I'm just not going to forward <laughs> the BitTorrent packets, and I'm going to prioritize the, the T TF1, I'm sorry, <laughs> TF2. Um, TF2. In my day, we played Tribes. I don't know if you guys ever heard of that. Um, you, anyway, <laughs> TF2. Um, so so, so, so the, those packets would get high priority, and the BitTorrent packets would get lower priority. Um, but there's something even simpler that happens at the endpoints. Do, do you know what that is? The other mechanism is that yeah. uh, each time you send a packet, you expect a response packet yeah. and acknowledgement yes. for that. In. And so yes. you can only send the next packet after you receive the acknowledgement, or after a certain number of packets. Right. So, so do you know what you do when you don't receive an acknowledgement? You send back the original packet again, assuming that it's been lost. Yeah, but how long? Do you, do you, but like, do you send it right away, or do you? You back off, exactly. So the algorithm that, that it's been around for a very long time, the algorithm that we use uh, for congestion control uh, at endpoints is this back off algorithm. Um, so, so what you do is you, for TCP IP, you, you have to get an acknowledgment for every packet. So you send the packet, and then you wait for the acknowledgment. And if you don't get the acknowledgment, you send it again. And, and eventually, it's guaranteed to, to get there, if there <coughs> if, or, or it'll tell you if it didn't get there. Um, if you don't get the acknowledgment, um, you don't send it, uh, the packet again right away, because what would happen if you did, if everybody did that? If everybody sent, pack, sent, sent the, new, the new packet as soon as they, after, you know, as soon as the acknowledgement timed out. The entire network would fill up yeah. the transmission. Yeah, everybody would just be screaming at each other, trying to get everything <laughs> through, and nothing would get through, right? Like, it would just be this exponential um, blow up. So what we do is, th th we all have this handshake agreement to do this back off. We're going to wait a random amount of time after failing to receive an acknowledgement, and that amount of time will increase over, over time, so as, as I continue to fail to receive acknowledgements. Um, so what that means is, instead of having this exponential blow up, I'm going to, uh, you know, if my packet's failing to get through, I'm going to just send fewer and fewer and fewer packets um, until things hopefully clear up and, you know, things, things sort of start to work again. Yes? Yeah, and this is what happens in Gmail, if I understand correctly, when you get disconnected. I was like, try again in two seconds, try again in four seconds. Uh -huh. And you can, you can manually click it, but it's trying to be, uh, trying to, like, I guess, play the game nicely. Yeah, so, so like, good actor, like, and, of course, a bad actor can, can, call it, can, can get throughput without, without um, following the rules. They can, you don't, there's no, there's no, like, you know, legal like rule for this. It's just a, a technical thing that everybody does, and because we all do it, the internet is nice. Um, this is something like you know, this political in, is, issues with this now, with people talk about net neutrality. That's exactly what they're saying. Like you know, we should all follow these nice rules. Um, Verizon shouldn't be able to charge Google or Netflix extra money in order to route their packets with higher priority. Um, we should just all be blind and and serve the, the packets as fast as possible. So this paper was really interesting because um, it compared 
um, this, this conventional back-off algorithm. And then in networking research, there's more, people spend a lot of time thinking about more complicated things you can do. So these names here are all different, more complicated um, types of back-off that you can do for deciding how long to wait before you resend, before you retransmit your packet. So, so what this guy, his name is Keith Winstein, um, did is formalize it. So these Remy results, he formalized it as an MDP. And then, uh, and then the, the parameters of the MDP were things like how much you cared about throughput versus latency and something about your network topology, if you knew that, or, or if not, it could, it could <coughs> marginalize it out. And then, and then solves the MDP to come up with the optimal strategy for how long to wait before you retransmit in different conditions. Um, so it's this algorithm generator that kind of you know, reproduces and outperforms the, 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 these other algorithms that networking researchers have, have studied uh, over the over the years, and this was, uh, in my opinion, a resounding success of MDPs, like coming to this different field and saying, "Look, here's here's how to do it in a, in a very general way, um, following the, the mathematical formalism." And to to get this working, he had to spend a lot of time thinking about how to write down the state space in a small way, so that um, the Markov property would hold. They had few model parameters, but enough of them to actually estimate uh, what was going on in the network in, in a useful way. So. So I like that example because there's a recent paper that um, showed that MDPs can work. And if you're interested, you can check it out. Yes? Do you know how much more optimal this was than traditional um, So, So this is the, the figure from his paper. So queuing delay is smaller. The throughput is higher. Um, so I don't know, 1.8 megabytes per second versus 1.2 megabytes per second. Now this was with a specific network topology that he tested to um, in, in his paper. So this doesn't necessarily mean if you, if all the, because to make this work, all the endpoints have to run it, right? Um, this doesn't necessarily mean in the real internet with, uh, you know, with all the endpoints running, we'll get these kinds of speed ups. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a recent research result that says in this particular network that he tested that he thinks is representative, and I didn't read the paper closely enough to actually have an opinion about it, I just trust Keith, so I think it probably is pretty good, but, but I don't know for sure. So, so this network, which he's claiming is representative of what the actual internet is, um, you get these, quanti quantitatively, you get these speed ups, but that doesn't necessarily translate to what would happen if Netflix and, I don't know if it's Verizon and Comcast and all the internet providers all ran this. Um, it's still, I think it's very exciting because um, it's this, you know, um, when, you com when, you, when you, even in the simulated world, looking at the quality, quanti the, the, the magnitude of the speed up um, and seeing it come from this nice mathematical framework, I thought was pretty exciting. And I have a feeling there's a lot more of these types of cases out there where we can come in with MDPs and if you're clever about the state space and clever about the assumptions that you make, um, if you can find a good way to solve it, you can get these kinds of, uh, of wins. And, and we've seen that, you know, we're like in Go and um, Backgammon, and I think we've just scratched the surface. So, 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 so I'm sort of trying to get you guys to see, that, I don't know, I'm trying, so my take on it, I guess, is like, you know, there's some places where we don't use it and I think we, we could, we just haven't figured out how yet. In other places where we do use it, um, I think I, I didn't put this up yet, but uh, picking uh, what, web, what ad to show on the internet where we, you know, it works really well, or backgammon, or, or Go, or these robot control applications. And there's some where we're just starting to see you know, emerging results where we use it, it, it works really well, and hasn't actually been you know, deployed on the whole internet yet, but like it, it's, it's a really promising uh, direction that leads to some interesting new results. Okay, any questions about any of that? Anybody else want to share their MDP? All right, so we're going to talk next about bandit problems and exploration versus exploitation. Um, so, so we sort of talked about this last time uh, with Q learning, and we, we, had this we had this epsilon greedy strategy. So anybody remember what epsilon greedy was, was doing? Yeah, right. So you pick some epsilon, like 0.1 or 0.8 or something, and 0.1% of the time or 0.1, with 0.1 probability or 1% of the time, depending on, is that 10% of the time? 10% of the time, thanks guys. Um, you will act randomly, and the rest of the time you're going to act optimally with respect to whatever thing that you're estimating. Um, and, and that is a pretty, it's very simple, it's just a little if statement, and if you remember from our Q learning code from last time, it was just this if statement, we flipped a coin and we decided what action to take, and it turns out to be very powerful um, in terms of 
a, a, a way of figuring out what uh, action you should execute. But um, it turns out that you can do better. Do you, uh, so does that kind of make sense that you could do better? Why, why do you think you could do better than Epsilon Greedy? Because at some point, if you've explored enough, then like yeah. exploring doesn't have the same value. Yeah, exploring has kind of diminishing returns, right? If I've explored a state a lot, eventually, you know, it, it doesn't make sense for me to explore it anymore. I kind of know what's going to happen, uh, and, I, and, I, and I don't need to go explore anymore. Um, and if I haven't explored a state very much, you know, I, it might be you know, good for me to direct my, my resources in that direction. So that intuition is what is kind of driving our max. Like, I'm going to bias my exploration towards the states I haven't been in. And if I've been in a state a lot, I'm going to explore less. But I, but I might still go there if it's a good place, if there's cookies. Um, if I know there's cookies, because I've been there enough to, to be able to predict that. Um, so what we're going to do uh, is study this in the context of, of what are called bandit problems. So does anybody know what a one-armed bandit is? I didn't know this until I read about reinforcement learning. It's a slot machine. It's a slot machine. Yeah, I, d I had no idea. I thought when I read the RL textbook, I was like, that's a weird name. And then, um, you know, I don't know, months later, I think I figured out, oh, it's a slot machine. <laughs> um, it's called a one-arm bandit because you pull the arm, the slot arm, and then it, it takes your money. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, so the idea behind a bandit problem is you have a bunch of these slot machines um, and you don't know the payoff. So um, we're going to assume that there, it's, it's a penny slot machine, so you're going to flip a coin. You don't know the weight of the coin and we're not going to, at first, we're, not, we're just going to assume it's, it, it's parameter can, you know, we have a uniform distribution over what the, the weight of the coin is and we're going to try to decide um, we want to maximize our payoff. <coughs> Okay, so we put our, our penny in, we pull the slot machine, and we, um, and we either lose the penny or we get two pennies back. Um, so we get a plus one or a minus one reward for uh, each play. We have a row, and we get to decide uh, how to do it. Um, we get to decide which one to pull. And our goal is to maximize the money that we make um, in this little investment game. Okay, so how do you decide which lever to pull? What could you do? Yeah, you could just try them and, and, then, and then like try to remember which one gives you the most pennies or cookies, whatever you refer to your reward quantity as. Uh, as. And the one that gives you the most uh, is the one that is, is probably got the best reward and you just keep pulling that one um, over and over and over. Um, so, so there's sort of, uh, so there's sort of exploration. Like I'm going to try them all. And how many times should I try them? It's not obvious, is it? Right? Like I try them all ten times, maybe, um, and 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 then, or should I try them all a hundred times, or a thousand times? It's it's not clear. Um, so, <coughs> what we're going to talk about today is we're going to sort of explore different strategies for how many times we should try the different stop machines before we start really focusing on the ones that, um, that pay off uh, with the most uh, reward. So formally, um, so there's actually, uh, before we do that, a lot of examples of, of these problems. So one is deciding what ads to show on a website, right? So I've got, I'm Google, and you've just done a Google search for reinforcement learning. And Google is going to display five ads, and it's got a big database, a really big one, of which ads to show. And it's going to decide. It's going to pull a lever and, and pull and, and pick you know, an ad to show you. And then you, the user, are going to give them a payoff or not. You're going to click the ad or you're not going to click the ad. Okay? And Google doesn't know, you know how much, how likely this ad is to cause you to click the, the reward. It's trying to figure out. It's trying to estimate um, the ad that's most likely to cause click-throughs and, and maximize their return because click-throughs is what they... Um, they charge for basically. So you pay. Google gets paid. Google makes their money because you, the advertisers pay them in terms of how many times people click their ad. So they want you to click your <coughs> their their ad. Um, people also use this for uh, A/B testing in websites. So who knows what A/B testing is? Um, basically, you have two versions. Um, uh -huh. Right, so, so you are trying, you're doing a startup, let's say, and you're trying to get people to sign up for your website. 
and you have two versions of the sign-up page, one which maybe offers a free gift and the other one which doesn't. You know, maybe you, and you want to know if your free gift is actually working. Is, are more people signing up if you give them the free gift or not? Um, so again, it's a bandit problem. You're trying to <laughs> estimate the, the, uh, the, the, the performance of these two different slot machines. There's, is this one going to lead to more sign-ups than, than that one? And people will do this to test different layouts, um, different uh, designs for how the website actually looks or color schemes, and they'll do it for more important things like offering different motivational things like sign up for this or this free gift versus that free gift um, to basically try to quantitatively study uh, their, their users. Another example from the book is allocating money to different research groups. So you're the government. This is something that's very relevant to me right now as a new professor. You know, and they're trying to decide, you know, there's all these professors at all these universities asking NSF, the National Science Foundation, for money. And they're trying to decide, uh, and they want to produce great research. And they're trying to decide which proposal is most likely, or which research group is most likely to produce great research if they give them money. Um, and one of the things that they look at is the success of their previous times that they gave money to, to those different proposals. So, um, and, and they'll use that in making decisions about how to allocate money the next time around. So we just, um, you know, and this happens a lot. I mean, so, so you know, it's, it's, you know, for me right now, it's, it's the National Science Foundation, but this idea of resource allocation happens uh, in startups with venture capital things. It happens when you're trying to decide how much money to pay people for your salary negotiations. Um, so, so anytime there's these kind of scarce resources and you're, and you're doing this allocation, it looks like a bandit problem. We are trying to decide which action to take and then you're going you're gonna to get a payoff. So before we go on, I want you guys to turn to a partner next to you and come up with some bandit problems of, of your own and then we'll share them back with the class. Thirty more seconds. Um, All right, guys. Finish up. Okay, who wants to share? Yes. So you're playing Pokemon. And Pokemon. And you're playing of Grass, and you're really trying to catch an Abra. And uh -huh. you're not sure which one it would be in. Uh -huh. So you walk around and you fight different Pokemon, uh -huh. and so you're trying uh -huh. to evaluate the best uh -huh. ones. Right, so, so you have to decide how many times to try that patch of grass um, before, you're, before you um, switch and how to distribute your exploration versus your exploitation. So Pokemon trying to catch, what's an Abra? Um, it's the first iteration of the psychic Pokemon, Abra, Kadabra, Alkadam. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and there's three patches of grass. That's the actions. And which one, which one? OK, what else? Good. Uh, your shopping classes in the beginning of the semester. Oh, good. <laughs> you have to decide whether to um, keep going to a bunch of different classes or, and do all the work for them or settle <laughs> on a particular set of classes. Yeah, so you're trying to decide which class is going to give you the highest payoff over the long term. 
uh, and you get to, I guess you, what's different about that is you don't get to iterate, right? So, so, so you take, like you, you don't get to take, you could take AI over and over and over if you wanted to. <laughs> um, but you could go to each, you know, go to But you could go to each lecture over and over. Okay, I see. So, you're, so, so, that, so, it, so every day you get to decide which classes you're going to go. And if you go, you get the incremental benefit of the knowledge that's transferred to you from that lecture. Um, and eventually, you have to decide, like, what set are you going to keep playing and which set are you going to cut and not go to anymore. Yeah, good. I like that. Shopping classes. Anybody else? Yeah. You have a collection of students, and you ask them questions in class on a regular basis. You have which? A collection of students. And okay. You ask them questions in class on a regular basis. Students and in class. <laughs> And, so and I'm trying. What's my so? This is me, and what's my payoff? <laughs> <laughs> Only you can answer that. <laughs> Only I can answer that. No, actually, um, there there is a payoff. I get to. I mean, there there's a benefit to hearing from you guys, and and it actually kind of bothers me. It's not bothers me in a bad way, but I want all of you to talk. And sometimes, you know, there's some people that talk more than others, and I'm trying to decide. You know, how can we get more of you to speak up? <laughs> But also, you know, the people who, who like to talk a lot, like, I want to hear from you, too. Like, like you know, it's, it's almost too bad that we only have a limited amount of time in class. We can't just all hang out and talk all day about AI. Um, and, and so it's like this scarce resource problem. And I get to decide every time <coughs> somebody raises their hand, or even not, I could decide who to call on um, and, and contribute your voice to what we're all talking about today, based on how we're going to learn AI in the most effective way possible. Um, nice, nice one. Are scarce resource, pro resource problems bandit problems? Are, are all scarce resource problems bandit problems? Well, so the thing about the bandit problem it, that that makes it that that is <coughs> sort of special is this idea that there's only one state. Oh, okay. So if I was so 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 a lot of a couple of these problems maybe maybe all of them I don't know about Pokemon, um, but for definitely for these two you know you, you, we're we're modeling it as if you're just getting more reward over time, but really. You know, you're changing in terms of what your interests are and stuff like that. You're like as you're shopping classes. Um, it's not just about maximizing your utility, or maybe it is, but it's like some meta utility about you know what your underlying goals are and and stuff. And and similarly for for this, you know, we're going through the semester, and so it's really not Markovian, as as guess as I guess what I'm trying to say. Um, and that's so even though we choose to model it that way, um, that's sort of what makes it a bandit problem. That, that that it's really a slot machine. Right. Like you just get to decide which lever to pull. You get a cookie, or you know, or you don't, and you have to, you know, go from there. Okay. All right. Um, so so here's how you can formalize it. So um, as an MDP, so you have a state, um, you have an action. So you have to pull a lever from a zero to a n. So just whatever. Slot machine there is. So, so there are only two states. The, the states don't correspond to which slot machine you pull. The, the actions do. Um, and then your transition um, basically takes, so the S0 state is where you get a cookie and the S1 state, I think that's what I said. Yeah, and the S1 state is where you don't get a cookie. Yeah, minus one. Um, so your transition doesn't depend on your current state. It just depends on the action that you take. All right, so regular MDP, this would be uh, A and your current state, but I, it doesn't matter. It just ignores it. Um, so based on what action uh, you, you decide the slot machine, mu is the parameter of the slot machine. So, in the, and we're going to, you know, it, it could be, you know, a multinomial. There could, like in real slot machines, you get to, you know, you get three cherries or something, and you get different amounts of payoffs. For, for us, for today, we're going to keep it really simple. So mu, we're gonna, our slot machine is a, is a coin that we're going to flip, and mu is the weight of the coin. So what's the probability that coin is going to be heads? Um, and then we get our reward based on the outcome of the coin flip. So if the coin flip is heads, we get a cookie, and if it's not, we don't, and we don't know the muse. Um, so, so if we did know the muse, what should we do? <laughs> so I'm doing my optimization. <laughs> if we did know the muse, and we wanted to get the most cookies as we could, the most, the most payoff. Yeah? Right, so we argmax max over our muse. And, 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 and just do that. We never have to explore. We would just keep pulling that lever as much as possible. OK, so how can we, yes? Why is it necessary that there's only two states? Like, could you have multiple states of great, uh, like varying amounts of payoff? Or like yes, you could. So, so you could decide um, to have the reward function be more complicated. Uh, so in, that, in the way that I've encoded this, that would involve having more states. So, so um, your distribution, like maybe you would get one penny, maybe you'd get the jackpot, and you'd get a million dollars, and and 
and you know there's sort of you know uh, and 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 there's sort of a distribution over the outcomes that could happen. Uh, actually, it turns out like I was reading a, a recent paper. So the algorithm we're going to be talking about, one of the algorithms we'll be talking about, this paper came out in 2012, and generalized. So we're going to talk about like these are called Bernoulli bandit problems because we're slipping a coin. Like so, it's a Bernoulli distribution. Um, so this 2012 paper generalized the algorithm that we're talking about to handle more complicated reward paths where you can get a real valued reward um, in, in, in a more complicated setting. Uh, and it's basically the same algorithm that works in Bernoulli Award. But what was striking to me was that this paper just came out in 2012. Like it's a, it was a recent thing. Um, so, so, so that's sort of the, the, the formal version of this. And we don't know, and, and if we knew the muse, it'd be easy. We just you know, pick the one that gets the highest payoff and, and go from there. Um, but in practice, we don't know the muse. So what can we do? Yes? Try and estimate the muse by sampling from all the slides. Right, so we can try and estimate the muse. So let's um, do that. So here is um, the code. So this is our, our little bandit guy. So let me, um, so in this, let me make this bigger actually. Is it in options? Is that default font? There we go. Okay, so, so we have this little bandit. It's going to be a three-armed bandit. And I'm going to set, manually, I'm going to set the payoff to be this so that all our algorithms are sort of in the same uh, space in terms of possible reward. That, that may our, our rewards can be sort of directly compared to each other. Because it might be the case that our best one, like if one of them, the best one was 0.9, and the other one, the best one was 0.3, then the one, the, the one that was operating in the 0.3 world would always have a lower payoff than the 0.9 one. So we're just going to set the, the, these payoffs. And then um, we're going to try these different methods of selecting uh, actions. So, 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 th so um, this random agent one. Uh, go up to the code here. Basically, iterates through picking a random action. So it just picks a random a uh, arm to pull, ignores everything, just does it randomly. Um, gets the reward from pulling that arm, and then yields back the action that it picked and the reward that it picked. Um, so down here, we're gonna for 20 trials, we're just gonna we're gonna try that strategy for a thousand iterations. Um, keep uh, sum up the reward, and then uh, print out the average reward we got over those 20 trials and the standard error. So that's an estimate of how, how close it is to the, the mean. So is it like really high variance or, or low variance? So let's do that. Um, make this bigger too. All right, so here's our little guy. This is the, the two probabilities. And this is the reward that our random agent gets, um, minus 94. So you can see it's actually pretty high variance. Um, and, and even we get the uh, high standard error, and we get these different numbers. So let's start and, and see if we can do better than our, our random guy. So, so what should we do? What's something simple? You want to say it again? Assuming yeah. That we don't. Yeah, we, we're gonna. Well, let's guy. let's let's do that. So so let's say optimal bandit iteration. So what's that guy gonna do? Just yeah, range iterations. Best AI equals two. Yep, because we know the answer, and then R equals we're gonna pull it best AI, and then we're gonna yield it back. Optimal. <coughs> okay, so that's the best we can do. Yes, and it works really well, right? Because we know the answer. It's really easy. Um, okay, so now we're going to pretend, even though we really do know what the optimal behavior is, we're going to pretend we don't. Yes? Could we just, like, you know, based on how many times, take like 10 times and just mm -hmm. figure it out from there? Yeah, so let's try that. So, so what you're saying is we're going to try randomly for 10 or 20 or 100 times? Yes? 
Oh. And then, or what do you, what, what, what did you mean? I would say pull each lever like 10 times. Pull each lever 10 times. See what happens. See what happens. And then after that, from each of that, and then pick the after that, calculate what to do. OK, let's do that. Um, I called that strategy something, and I forgot what I called it. Um, what should we call this? Try each lever. Standard <laughs> iterations. Um, OK, so, so let's just copy our little for loop. So what do we have to save? For each lever. Total score received from it. Yeah, like number of times we got a cookie and the number of times we didn't. So I'm going to call that S for successes. And that's going to be an array of the size of the actions I can take. And F for failures. OK, and then for each guy, let's see. Um, so let's say while. Iterations is less than 100. Um, AI equals iterations percent banded dot n arms. So everybody see what that's going to do? Just going to flip through each one, keep trying it, and then we're going to sample it. And at the end, we're going to yield. So let's do that too. And now, what do we have to do to do our update? So our reward is 1 or a 0. Yeah, so if r is what? One. Is 1, then what should I do? Okay. S of AI. Yes, plus equals 1. Else, S sub a, uh, f sub ai plus equals 1. Why are we storing the success? There should be an if. Um, it, because it's going to work better when we get to the, to the optimal algorithm. So we could, we could not do that, um, but it's just going to look, this, this makes this algorithm look similar to, to the one that's going to work the best. Um, we, and we'll actually, we'll go, after we do this, we can go through the math of, of this. So this is basically doing a maximum likelihood estimator of the mean of each arm, of the probability of each one giving me a heads and tails or over the 100 iterations. And then after that, what do I, so I'm just going to, for now, we're just going to say if iteration left in 100, do this. And then after that, so I've done my trials, I've done my exploration. I'm going to be purely exploring, OK? And now I'm going to exploit. So now what do I do? Yes? It use this one that's selected continuously? Yeah, I'm going to compute the one. I'm going to compute my probabilities. I'm going to compute my muse, and then I'm going to use the one that's the best. Just that and nothing else. OK, so how do I do that? Will people be sad if I do this with a list comprehension? Bandit dot actions. So what should each probability look like? The probability of success S using them. Yeah, so S sub AI divided by S sub AI plus F sub AI. Four. Does that look good? What's that? I don't think I, maybe I do because it's, all, yeah. yeah. Maybe, maybe Numpy will do the right thing, but OK. All right, so now I've got my probabilities. So what should I do after that? Find the max. Find the max, yeah. So na.argmax probabilities, best AI equals <gasps> that, and then I'm going to sample that. OK. I remember what I call this. I call this explore, then exploit. This way it matches my slides. OK, so we're just going to stick this in here. Explore, then exploit. All right, so, so we're doing pretty good, right? Like we're, we're getting 542 plus or minus. We'll run it a couple more times. Um, you can see you know, the plus or minus doesn't necessarily mean it's going gonna, it's gonna to go with repeating trials. I should maybe run it for some more trials. But I was trying to tune it so it would run quickly during, during the lecture. Um, yeah? Is it running one more trial on the first one? Yeah, it might, it might be. Yeah, so, so I wasn't particularly careful. So, so you, I think your original idea was let's run 10 trials on each. Right. 
And because I just decided to cut it off at, at 100 up here, 100. So what if I decided to make this bigger, like 500? I'll make the casino very happy. So is my performance going to go up or down, do you think? <coughs> down, right. Why? Yeah, I probably already have a pretty good estimate, but I'm still going to just be frying them off for a long time until I'm really sure, and then I'm going to start pulling my, pulling my slot. Um, what if I do really small? Maybe. Yeah, I don't really know. Like, it just <laughs> sort of depends on what happens. Like, if there's only, you know, let's try it. You know, so, so here, you know, I did pretty good. I did really good. I beat the <laughs> optimal. <laughs> why, why, is, that could still, why, why could that happen? Probabilities. It's probabilities, yeah. So my optimal is always going to pull the best one, but this guy could have just gotten luckier. You know, it's, it's just random numbers in there. So, so we don't really know. Um, maybe I'll go down even more. Like, what if I only do it three times? This <laughs> game's getting better. Okay, so, so here we saw, right? So, so here, I got lucky. I, I did it three times, and I probably got zero, zero, one. And I picked the one that got one, and I just kept doing that. Um, and this one, you know, it's, it was less likely, maybe, but I probably got one, zero, zero, because the other one's 0.8. The, the, the best one's 0.8. And then I just like, okay, let's do that one forever. I'm never going to reevaluate that decision. I'm just going to keep going um, and, and, and never go. So we have this kind of funky thing here where this iterations parameter, we have to decide what it should be. And it, what it should be is different depending on the true state of the world, right? So if my, you know, if the world was really good, if everything was like 0 0.8, 0 0.1, 0 0.81, 0 0.82, 0 0.83, <coughs> it kind of doesn't matter. If I pick the wrong one, I'm going to get good reward all the time. So I might want to spend more time exploring so that in the, so the really long term, I eventually settle on the right one because the cost of that isn't very high. Whereas in this world where it's, it's um, set to be 0 0.8 versus 0.2 and 0.3, if I screw up and get the wrong one, I'm really going to pay for it because I could have been in 0 0.8 all this time and, and it really sucks. Um, so, so, so there's this trade-off that doesn't seem like it really depends on some number that I can just pick arbitrarily ahead of time and, and keep it uh, the same for, for, for the future. So how can I do better? I mean, you could probably just do some like, stats 101 hypothesis <laughs> testing, uh -huh. bound your confidence on yeah. each of these, and then reject yeah. with a one-tail t-test. Yeah, so, so we're going to do something like that. Um, uh, so maybe we'll go back to the slides and talk about the math of what we just did. And then, and then talk about the, the better way to do it, or a better way to do it. Um, what happened? Oh. Okay. So what we're trying to do in our, in our bandit problem is maximize our expected return. So here the mu's are the probability of the, the true probability of the reward. I sub t is the lever I pulled at, at time, step, time, time step t. And I'm trying to find this I sub t. That's my policy here, the, the lever I'm going to pull that maximizes my expected return, um, the summation of all the rewards that I get over time. Um, people also talk about um, something called regret. So does anybody want to guess what regret is in, ma in machine learning? Or maybe you know what regret is? <laughs> regret. <laughs> it's really a depressing technical concept, but. Just from the name, what do you think? Yeah? <coughs> What's that? You do the wrong thing too many times. Yeah, and what happens if you do the wrong thing? Bad. Yeah, <laughs> right. Like, there's, like, it could have been so awesome, and yet it wasn't. <laughs> you know, I could have picked that eight lever the whole time. We, d we coded up the optimal policy. We know, you know what the expected return was. And instead, I, you know, I decided to pull that other one, that point two. And I could have gotten a reward, and I didn't. Okay, so regret is trying to quantify this. It's basically saying, um, so, so mathematically, um, if I did pick the optimal policy, here's my expected return. I'm going to subtract from that the return from the expected return from the one I actually did pick. Okay, what's the difference between the best one that I could have picked and the one that I that I, my whatever my policy decided to pick went on to to pick? And you can. Um, Write this, I think I did this on the slide. In a different way, I did that. OK, so, so this is that same equation as, as before here. Um, so this 
and this are the same. Uh, and you can factor this in a different way so that you basically can write this in terms of the difference between the true one and the one that you actually picked, which is not under the expectation, and the counts of the times that you picked that policy. And it turns out for a lot of these algorithms, if you, if you minimize regret, the math works out in a nicer way than trying to maximize the return. So just thinking about it in, in this way um, makes things better. Okay. Is minimizing regret equivalent to maximizing Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, so if I pick the, the way to think about that is if I pick the optimal policy all the time, I'm going to maximize the return. Um, so if I minimize my regret, the, the, the cost that I paid by not paying the optimal policy, the, the zero version of that is I'm always going to do the optimal thing. Okay. Um, okay. So that's sort of the world that I'm in. I'm trying to, it's like a very d a glass half empty versus a glass half full view of what you're trying to optimize. Okay. So how can we solve the bandit problem? Um, so so uh, we talked about, actually, so, so we could do, and if, if you want, we can code it up. Um, we can do Q learning. So, so how can we do Q learning to do this? Choose a random number with some mm -hmm. amount of time, some probability, yep. and otherwise just like trying yep. to do your best. Right. So we could do an epsilon greedy kind of exploration strategy, and the rest of the time do a TD update, just like we were doing in, in reinforcement learning. And, and, uh, and keep track of our Q values, our expected returns over time, and, and, and solve it. So, it's, so, so this, is just, this is a sort of you know, collapsed version of an RL problem, so we can use this RL strategy to, to solve it. Um, so this is sort of the model-free version of the world. So we can code it up, and I have <laughs> code for it, but maybe we'll skip it because I don't want to run out of time. So, the next thing we're going to talk about is what we already did. So, so we're going to do the math of, of what we already did. The maximum likelihood estimator for the parameters, so model-based method, the parameters of our, of our uh, model. So here we want to know that the, so, so this is sort of the def definition of our slot machine. The probability that x equals 1 given my parameter mu equals mu. It's a Bernoulli distribution. I'm going to flip a coin and the coin has a weight mu. So now um, I get my data, OK? So I'm flipping my coin 10 times, or 100 times, or 1,000 times, however many times I get it. And I want to estimate my mu. So how can I do it? You can write it like with a function, and then take the first derivative, and mm -hmm. maximize that, which ends up Exactly, the yeah. So, so, so what is that going to look like in, in math? The likelihood. What's the likelihood function going to be in math? Let's write it on the whiteboard. It's the probability of your data given some p. Probability of my data given mu. Yeah. OK. Does that make sense to everybody? So let's make it appear here. So I can factor this, because I'm assuming my slot machines, I'm going to give them the casino the benefit of the doubt. My slot machines aren't correlated. So I can write this as, so my data is x1 to xn given mu. Um, so this is all coming from one slot machine, actually. So I, I, I misspoke, actually. So we're all, in all of this math, we're in just one slot machine now. We're just thinking about the, the, the samples from, from our one machine that we're thinking about at a time. OK, so then I can write this as the product over i, the probability of x sub i given mu. And what I get is a Bernoulli distribution over, over these samples. So to do maximum likelihood estimation, um, so, so then this, so this is the Bernoulli distribution with the, the x to the n and 1 minus x to the n, probability of heads, probability of tails. Um, this should be on the outside, I think. Sorry about that. And then uh, for maximum likelihood, we're going to do arg max over mu probability of d given mu. So what do you think about that? So first of all, what happens if you take the, f how, can we, how can we solve that? What does it look like? <coughs> so so you, already, you already said, but like, um, we take the first derivative of, of this, we set it equal to 0, and we come up with, the, you can solve it. You can do a bunch of algebra and solve it. What does it look like when we do that? Somebody else? Do 
So what would you do without, without any of this probability stuff? What would you do if you had these XDs? So you have heads, 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 tails, tails. <laughs> and you want to know what is mu. So I have three heads and two tails. Not a trick question. Yeah? You would assume that the probability is based on the expectation of the values that you've gotten. Yeah, so, so quantitatively, what am I going to do? So this is number of successes. This is numbers of failures. You would assume that the ending probability would be 3 over 5 for the success? Yep, yep. 3 over 3 plus 2. Or more generally, what would it be? The probability of successes over the total trials. Yep, s plus is f. successes. Over yeah, three. OK. So it's just the average, right? There's no, it's not magic. It's the average. Um, what this is telling us, I'm not showing the, the math of this. Um, so here, so here it is in two different ways of writing it. So one over n times the summation of x to the n when x is zero, ones and zeros, um, or here it is in terms of s over s plus f, using the variables we've, we've been using. Okay, so we're just going to take the average, and use that to estimate our mu. That's the maximum likelihood estimator, and where it comes from is not like it wasn't handed down from on high. It comes from setting the derivative of this expression equal to zero and solving the argmax. Did I take, oh, the, yeah, the argmax, this argmax, okay? So if you set this derivative <laughs> equal to zero and, and plug it in, you get this expression from UML is the one that solves this argmax, okay? You can go read in, in lots of textbooks, lots of websites, they'll actually go through the algebra of taking that derivative and, and stuff. Does that make sense to you guys? Why, why this kind of works out? So what do you think of the maximum likelihood estimator? It's OK, but it doesn't really factor in uncertainty about mu. Yeah, right. So, so there's, you know, like, like it's not really telling us how long can we, how long should we run in our, you know, how many samples should we take? And, and you know, it's not really capturing the uncertainty. We're just going to get some number, and we're going to use it. So, so just like we had in our Python code, we just, you know, we could run it one time, we could run it a thousand times, we could get a number, and we could use it. Um, it didn't tell us uh, how long we should keep running. So, so what else about our uncertainty over mu? Isn't it taking it into account? <laughs> There's too many uh, negations. So, so like, what do we know about mu before we start? I haven't said what we know about mu. So, so, so what could we know about mu? Well, we, okay, you're right. We do know that because it has to be a probability. So there's, so there's these sort of bounds. What about within that space? What if we know nothing about mu? What's, what's the sort of maximum entropy version of, of that? What's it look like? Somebody else. If we know nothing about mu, what's our distribution over what mu could be? Yeah. 50, 50. 50. Well, mu's a real number. It goes between 0 and 1. Right, it's a uniform distribution, right? So, so, so it's going to look like this, if I know nothing. Do I really know nothing? Like, what if mu is a penny? I show <laughs> you the penny. I open up the little shot machine, and you see that there's a little penny inside with a little camera that takes a picture of whether it's heads or, or tails. Now what do you think about mu? Before we start. Probably 0.5. Probably 0.5, yeah. I mean, maybe I don't, I mean, now I learn, OK, probably 0.5, so maybe, it's a, maybe I know it's 0.5. Then I'm in like this peaky state, right? And I don't have to do anything. I just know the answer. Maybe I just think it's probably 0 0.5. I'll stick a Gaussian there or something. Now I find out that the, the, the casino is, is sketchy. OK? So they show me a picture of the penny. And you know maybe I think it's kind of 0.5, but I don't know. Like there was an article in the paper in, in Las Vegas that said this casino is, is not, not doing the right stuff. Now what do you think? You have to see the other side of the penny. Yeah, but before you can, OK, so you could get more information and, and update. So we're currently in our Janesian world. We could collect more information. Before we have that information, what do we think? We don't, yeah? If we think of the casino's dodgy, then we assume that the, the, uh, the expected value will be pushed further to the lower end of the spectrum. Yeah, maybe, maybe we think it's, it's lower. Maybe we just spread it out. Like, we, we think it's, it's a, fl I'm not trying a very good flatter curve. Like maybe it looks like a penny, so I'll give it some extra probability mass at 0.5, but I'm going to give myself a bigger variance, okay? 
So is this maximum likelihood estimator incorporating any of that information in his estimate? No. How, how can we incorporate more of that information? So you could. Sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah. Go. Go. No. Okay. Go. <laughs> you, you can do some Bayesian statistics and have yes. some prior estimate. And gather exactly. So what we're talking about here, is, and when, we, when we draw the un this is a uniform prior or these different peaky priors, is different prior distributions on what we think that, um, that mu could be. Okay. So uniform says, well, I just don't know. It's some real number between 0 and 1. I'm not going to make any commitments about it at whatsoever. The, the, this peaky one here says, I know for sure. It's 0.5, and that's it. Everything else is 0. Um, so I'm not going to, if I really think that, I'm not going to ignore, I'm going to ignore all my data. I'm just going to close my eyes and always pick the, well, I, if I was doing this for all my slot machines at once now, I would be just picking the one with the, with the maximum reward. Um, and if I'm somewhere in here, I'm going to do something complicated, right? So what do I have to do if, if, if it's something like this? Or uh, any of these forms, what, what, what can I do? So what do I want to know? I want to estimate mu, right? So prob probabilistically, like, what, what can I write down? Probability of what given what? Success given particular machine? Well, I'm just going to be in, in for, for now, for the next five minutes, in one machine. So, so I have mu, and I have my data, just like before we got to the maximum likelihood estimator. Yeah. Mu given, <coughs> mu given d. Yep, mu given d. <coughs> And how can I estimate that in a Bayesian way? This is the Bayesian way of doing things. You can use Bayes' law. Yeah, I can use Bayes' rule. So, so what does that look like? I'm going to erase this one too. Somebody want to tell me Bayes' rule <coughs> with, this, with these variables? Yes? So just probability of d given mu. Yep, um, d given mu. Probability of mu over probability of d. Probability of d. And, what, and, and remember, I could rewrite this denominator. Sometimes we do that. How can we rewrite this denominator in terms of the numerator? You're not wrong. This was right. And I actually have that on, on the slides coming up. But <coughs> we're going we're gonna to rewrite this in terms of the numerator. So how can we do that? Yes? P, D, and mu 1 plus P, D, and mu 2 plus P, D, and mu 3. Yep. And what's that going to look like in the general case? So it's, you're talking about a summation, or, summation. An, or an integral. Yes, right, right. Yes, so, so, so this is going to be summation. I'm going to do an integral instead of a summation because actually we're in continuous space here. But same idea, same intuition. We're going to um, sum summation over, over this of probability of d given mu prime times probability of mu prime d. I should make this a prime. I'm sorry for messing my superscripts and subscripts. Mu prime, d mu prime. Okay, so this is my normalization constant. And I'm doing this so that this and this are, can be the same, right? The, um, the same functional form. Okay? All right. So now we're going to... So, so what's tricky about this in, my, in, my, in this world? So if I have some kind of weird-looking distribution over what I think the prior should look like. What's going to happen when I do this integral? Is it going to be easy or hard? Hard. Hard. Yeah. So if this is some weird thing, like, like if it's really what I drew with all these little curves and stuff, it's going to be really hard to compute this integral. Maybe I could approximate it with um, numerical methods or something. But computing integrals <coughs> in general is hard, and, and, and it, doesn't, it doesn't make my life easy. Um, so it turns out that what happens a lot, this happens a lot in Bayesian <coughs> methods. So, so you have, like the whole idea behind when people say Bayesian methods, what they really mean is I think I have a prior that, that's going to tell me something and I want to incorporate it into my estimate. I don't just want to do the maximum, maximum likelihood thing. I want to incorporate my prior information. And Bayes' rule says here's how you do it. This is, you know, the formula. But I have a nasty integral and I have to, you know, get around having the nasty integral. So, so what you do is you play a trick. Um, does anybody know, know what the trick is? Maybe you do, yeah? Yeah. 
you know that the summation across everything is to sum to one. So if you use something like a beta distribution, it's just the inverse of the constant of your distribution. Exactly. So if I pick my prior distribution to be special in a particular special way that makes this integral easy, then I can get th then this whole thing can cancel in a in a in a particular special way. So that it's easy to compute in, in exact form. And when people pick the prior in a particular special way, it basically depends on the form of the likelihood function. So what's the likelihood function in our slot machine example? What was it called? There was a name for it. The Bernoulli. Right? We're just doing coin flips, right? So, so usually the likelihood function, it's given to us. Like we, we have a pretty strong intuition. It is, a, like we're just going to assume it's a Bernoulli distribution. We're flipping these coins. It takes this functional form. And it turns out if you do, if you do math, like you can come up with what's called the conjugate prior of the Bernoulli distribution, which says if I decide to pick mu, the P of, of mu to take this particular functional form, which, which you said is the beta distribution, we're, we'll, we'll talk about that in a sec, then what happens is good, like good things will happen. This will all cancel out. And I can be a, tr a proper Bayesian, and I can compute this integral exactly, and everything is happy. Um, OK, so, so the way uh, that this um, happens, so this is all the math we just talked about. Maximum likelihood is argmaxing over p of data given mu. Maximum a posteriori, or the Bayesian way, is I'm going to maximize over p of mu given d. And the way to compute that is with, with uh, Bayes' rule with this integral. Um, so the problem is, the, is basically that this, oh, this is kind of confusing. But anyway, this distribution has, if it takes a particular form, everything cancels and things are easy. And there's a lot of research and sort of theoretical probability and stuff about finding distributions where we have good conjugate priors that model realistic things and yet also become mathematically easy. Um, and the one uh, for the Bernoulli distribution is something called the beta distribution. And this is it. Um, it kind of looks weird. Um, <coughs> and it, it is weird because it's, it's basically making that integral go away. Right? So it has to be kind of funky. Yes? Why do you calculate the denominator at all if it's going to be the same across everything instead of taking the best numerator? Yeah, we, so you're right. Um, if, if we wanted to not do a model-based method, then we could not compute the denominator. Yeah. I think, so, so let me actually, it depends what we're doing. So sometimes we don't need to calculate the denominator, and sometimes we do. And I, I, I have to think about it more, but my intuition is that when we're comparing across different slot machines, we actually do need to compute the denominator. Um, a common trick is, is to find ways to not have to compute it at all. Um, it turns out that by using this form, we can compute it exactly, and everything is happy. So that's the, the trick. Okay? So, so the conjugate prior of the Bernoulli distribution is something called the beta distribution. And what that means is, if I plug this into this equation, so if I take this to be the Bernoulli distribution of doing my coin flips, and this to be the beta distribution, and I plug it all in, this guy on the, on the left is going to be another beta distribution. It's not going to be some weird integral that I can't solve or some scary mathematical expression. It's going to be a beta distribution with different parameters fr from before. So it's this nice recursive form for, for how I can do my updates. Does that kind of make sense? I know the beta distribution looks scary. Um, however, this is sort of plots of what it looks like um, if for different values of its parameters. But what I think can, can be useful is if we actually look at um, the value of it for different parameters. So I have a little matplotlib script here. Let's start with one, one. And it's just calling scipy.stats.beta <coughs> for a range of values of x and finding out what the PDF looks like. Um, so here it is when, when x is 1 and y is 1. What does this look like? Uniform. Yeah. So if so it's kind of nice because there's a way, like my uniform distribution, I can encode it as a beta distribution with certain values of my parameters. It's kind of, kind of cool. So now let's see what happens if I, if I make my parameters bigger, like 10. What do you think is going to happen if you haven't seen this already? What do you think is gonna, it's going to do? Yeah. 
It's kind of hard to imagine it. If you, if without, I guess I haven't even told you what gamma is. Maybe it's not a fair question. Um, so, so what it's going to do, let's look, let's look at it, is it's going to put a peak right at 0.5. Um, so what these parameters, these alphas and betas, are like intuitively is they're like they're, they're called pseudo counts. So when I when I sort of believe that you know my my distribution is at peaky at 0.5, I I can sort of encode that in my parameters by saying, well, I'm going to just hallucinate that I've seen 10 heads and 10 tails, and when I put that in, it gives me this nice peak around 0.5, and it tails off somewhere else. Okay. And if I, if I try, like, um, maybe I've seen, let's try 20 alphas <coughs> and 10 betas, my, my little peak is going to move over, right? Because it's going to look like a non-fair coin. OK, so my beta distribution, what it is, is a distribution over distributions, OK? A draw from a beta gives me a real number between 0 and 1. It gives me a mu. And then a mu is a distribution over coin flips. Um, and by putting a prior on this, I'm saying, like, so if I put a uniform prior, I'm saying I can do, I'm going to start out by believing that it's uniform, and then I can do an update and get another beta distribution with a new alpha and beta, and, and sort of update in, 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 a, in a very nice Bayesian way. Okay? All right. And then, and so these different values, this is from Wikipedia, these are just different values of, of alpha and beta, and it can look very different. So it's a very expressive thing, like for, for encoding your prior beliefs, and yet uh, the math kind of collapses in a nice way. And there's lots of these. So like when people talk about the Dirichlet distribution, that's a, the conjugate prior of the multinomial distribution. And, and you can sort of go, and, and the Gaussian is the conjugate prior of itself. Um, so Gaussian's always nice, right? Um, and, and there's like, there's a lot of work studying different families of these. Okay. So this is the, when you, when you do this, so, so, this, so here, let me, let me go back to the slides. Um, so, so when you actually carry out this integration and plug the beta in and everything and everything cancels, this is what you actually get. So I have my successes and my failures and my initial parameters, my alpha and my beta. And if I don't know, I'm just going to say one, right? right? And that's going to give me a uniform prior. And then I, I sort of do my update and my, I basically plug in the new alpha and the new beta. So S plus alpha plus F plus beta everywhere I had alpha and beta before. Um, into my pseudo counts, and that will give me a posterior over what I think mu is now, after I've done my update. So um, concretely, what I can do is basically store the number of successes and failures. So this is sort of why I was saving S and F before, just because it kind of matches with this. Um, and then compute the posterior distribution. Um, and I can do that after one trial or after many trials, um, and, and do this Bayesian update over, over my uncertainty. Um, so not just one estimate of the parameter, but a distribution over what I think that parameter value is. Um, so so um, this leads to something which is called Thompson sampling for our bandit problem. So Thompson sampling is a really short little algorithm where we're basically storing our successes and our failures at each time step. Then for each arm, what we're going to do, is, it's a sampling-based algorithm. So I'm going to sample from my beta distribution that I compute from my S's and F's. I'm going to sample, here they're using theta instead of mu. So I'm going to sample some mu's for what I think those are. Then I'm going to play the arm that is the best according to my sample, OK? And then I'm going to update, do an update of my parameters. And I'm just going to keep doing that forever. So what's this algorithm going to do? at the beginning. So when, when, when my S's and F's are, are, are small, what's the beta going to look like? What, 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 was it, what did it look like when they were 1? Yeah. Flat. Yeah. And then what's going to happen as I get more S's and more F's? It's going to get peakier and peakier and peakier. So what's going to happen here in this step? What, what, are, my, what, what, what are my thetas going to look like? As I do that, they're going to be they're going to be they're going to be more likely to come from the best one, or they're going to be more likely to reflect reality. I guess, and that's going to mean I'm going to play the, re the the best one more and more and more. So I'm going to explore less and less and less as I get more and more data. Does that does that make sense? In this very natural way, it's all coming out of the of the conjugate prior. There's no parameter that I have to pick 
that says, I'm going to explore now and exploit later or, or something else. Um, so to code this up in the in sort of last five minutes, um, maybe I'll just show you the code. Um, Thompson sampling. So it's basically like the same thing we were doing before. We have the successes and the failures. Um, for each action, we sample our, our <coughs> mu's. I call them p's here. And then we pick the best one. That's the action that we take. And then we do an update based on that. Okay. So that's the Python code of the pseudocode we just saw. Um, so if we run that, let's run the correct version. Oh, no. It's supposed to be indented? Yeah. OK. So this is going to actually run a bunch of different algorithms, and we'll see. Um, so random agent, explore, then exploit. It might not be exactly the same as it was, but um, um, this is an ML agent doing epsilon greedy. And here's our Thompson sampling <coughs> doing the Bayesian thing. And it basically tends to get mo the, the most reward. And there's no futsy parameters that we have to tune and, and mess around with. Um, so, so it works really well. It's really cool. Like the, this is sort of applying our Jane's principles um, and, and, and trying to do the right thing. And what we get is an algorithm that's outperforming these, these other, other methods. So why don't we always do this? Why do we even have Q-learning in the first place? Yeah, yeah. We had to come up with that beta distribution, and you know, we had the mathematicians, we had Wikipedia to tell us what it was, and and you know, it's all inside of of Matplotlib. When we start getting to real world problems with sequences of decisions, it becomes much more complicated to do the right, supposedly optimal Bayesian thing. And there's a field called Bayesian reinforcement learning that basically studies how to do this. And they should, and they, and the, and the, the take of it, like the take-home message of Bayesian RL, is if you do the right thing, if you can do it, you'll outperform everything. It's the best thing you can possibly do, but it's really hard to do the right thing in practice. And very often, something like Q learning or something like policy search or RMAX, which we'll talk about next time, um, will outperform the the Bayesian optimal thing. Um, but that doesn't mean it's not worth knowing about because sometimes when we figure out a way to get closer to the right thing, we can still see um, these types of improvements. So I hope our dive into bandits was, was fun, and I'll see you guys next class when we talk about policy search and stuff.